all sad lights. I, I think it might help, you know, just give myself some ambient, ambient vitamin D because um, mm-hmm. what, what on earth is happening here? Um, there's someone just joined us accidentally. Um, there seems to be a third person here. Um, did something just happen? That was just quite strange. Um, I don't know. I don't. I don't know why that's there. I can't even get rid of it. So it may well be that's just how it is. We've just got this big black bar between us, Ariel. Um, yeah. Anyway, it's all fun and games when it comes to Brain Food Live, and Brain Food Live it is again. No fail every Friday, folks. Bringing it to you. It doesn't matter where in the world we are. It doesn't matter what is going on outside. It doesn't matter who's interviewing who. Brain Food Live is always happening at this time every single week. So welcome, everybody. Um, I hope you've had a great week so far and you're excited to have this show. Um, I just want to make sure that, um, firstly, audio visual is okay for everybody. Audio, if you can hear me on Crowdcast, please do let me know in the chat. Um, And visual, actually tell me whether you see something strange on screen because there seems to be like a kind of an additional character that's kind of a, a black mystery black. <laughs> um, in the middle of the screen here so did you also see that does that does that look strange to you um i don't know what it is it may be a maybe a, a new twist um that uh, crowdcast has given us uh, but let us know whether you can see that because if you can i actually think that's a good thing because it means that everyone's seeing the same thing um folks if you're watching this on linkedin and i believe that um people should be watching this on my linkedin um i think ariel's also publishing this on dado's uh career page um a company page i say juliana and rob of course always live streaming so if you're watching it in those places as well do let me know whether you can hear and see us okay. Um, You can indeed, which is all well and good. Um, And yes, who owns the Les Paul? That is, Errol's got an amazing history. I mean, I don't know whether we've got, in fact, we should dive into a little bit, but this this lady's a bit of a a mogul, you know, a bit of a music. um, uh, 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 She's super well, interesting background prior to entering product and HR and all the rest of it. Crazy stuff. Um, but anyway, uh, we have Ariel Kilroy on, on screen with us. So wonderful to see you, Ariel. How have you been? Uh, we were just talking about actually your return back to, to Germany today. So I hope that journey mm-hmm. was okay. It was a nightmare and you managed to, to have it safe. And yeah, it, it worked out well. Uh, my gamble and making sure I was back in time paid off so i'll remember it this time for all the times it doesn't work <laughs> yeah you know what i had a gamble as well right because I, I actually i'm in vietnam right now and i it was one mm. of those where i even though i travel like an idiot so i go loads of places and i should really know but um, for some reason i just like didn't think oh I, maybe i need a visa to enter um and then i realized oh when i try to check in like just a couple of hours before the flight it says oh you can't complete the check-in without a visa i thought oh my god i think i've screwed this because i've actually got a multi-city trip that's like loads of like flights are dependent on me actually being here so i thought oh my god this could couldn't go any worse so anyway i managed to wangle loads of things spent a ton of money um had to do an all-nighter last night in the airport just to make sure i made the super early flight and all the rest of it so i feel terrible now um but i'm, I'm here uh, and i'm able to continue my trip um so there we go um ariel there is this middle bar between us and what i'm going to try yeah. and do i hope you're not offended but i'm going to try and remove you from the screen because i think that do might it. remove this black bar and i'm going to bring you back is that going to be okay okay yeah. All right. Don't be offended if I kick you off like this. Okay. <laughs> don't, 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 don't be annoyed at me. Okay. Ariel's gone. Cool. Listen, folks, that, that was just a weird one. Thank you, Bob. My hair does look a little lighter than usual. I, it's all the lighting. I've got this up light coming at me and actually, yeah, I'm actually going gray as well. So there's another reason why that's going lighter. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Bob. Really appreciate it, mate. Um, all right. I'm going to try and bring Ariel back. Just bear with me two secs. I just wanted to get rid of that weird black, uh, uh, image there. Don't know what that was. Um, oh, I think it, it might have been Ariel's thing. No, no. Okay. Ariel should be coming back here. All right, cool. Um, well, listen, I hope everyone's having a, uh, by the way, whilst we're waiting for Ariel to come in, can you just quickly jump into the sidebar, um, and check out the polls, um, and make sure you cast, uh, your uh, vote on the polls there, please. Um, what is your preferred method of communicating a layoff? Um, because this is what this topic is about, offboarding, 
how to avoid a PR disaster. Obviously, we've seen some really interesting episodes um, go on over the last several weeks. And unfortunately, January has really led the way with a bunch of tech layoffs again, uh, which has depressed everyone in the tech scene. Um, and of course, it's kind of brought a lot of people onto, you know, onto the social media airways and recording their layoff uh, sort of calls, uh, writing up long LinkedIn spiels, all the rest of it. And it's really painful to see. But it's also a question that we need to ask, like, is there actually a way to do this better? Um, because it seems that no matter what choices employers actually use, whether it's just a harsh cut off, you know, uh, lock the people out and then deal with it later, or whether it's trying to do the right thing, then it ends up being like doxxed. Um, so is there a decent way to do it? Or is there a way in which you can kind of uh, kind of create the environment where people aren't motivated uh, to go in and um, and and throw the business under the bus. Um, so anyway, uh, put your votes in there. Let me know what your thoughts are. I'd be very very interested. Anyway, Aero, um, let's uh, tell us about you. Firstly, we should talk about you because um, yeah, yeah, thank you for sponsoring uh, this uh, this episode. I reckon you should tell us just a quick two liner about your music career first, um, and then. Tell us about <laughs> later. Yes. So I started my career out doing design and development for rock stars. And then I did um, direct to, I was one of the pioneers of direct to fan model. Uh, and I worked with the two biggest artists of the, on the internet at the time, Amanda Palmer and OK Go to develop that model. People thought we were crazy. You couldn't do it. But now, obviously that's the norm, so. That's it. She's a player, this lady. And and you you mm -hmm. kind of amazingly, you've had this really, really interesting career because you, you worked in sort of kind of the recruiting side and then you worked in the recruiting tech side um, as product. So tell us sort of a little bit about Dado. What is the product? Who should care about it? Um, uh, give us give us that uh, uh, overview, um, Ariel. Yeah, absolutely. So um, I, so I'm a product person. I became friends with my HR people. And then I was like, how are you doing this job even? This is insane. Look at your tool stack. This is terrible. <laughs> like, um, if you follow me on LinkedIn, you see I rant about the expectations um, on HR people all the time. Uh, so I ended, I wanted to do something about it because um, it was holding people back. So that's how data was born. We are the layer that's between your um, business tools and your uh, HR. We connect all of that so that you can actually run end-to-end -end, uh, employee experiences like onboarding, offboarding, uh, but all the fun stuff in between as well um, at scale. Uh, we're like nothing you've ever seen. It's impossible to imagine it until you've seen it. Um, people often call it real automation, which is embarrassing for the things that are not real automation. Um, but it's you know it really just changes companies' lives, and it brings me so much joy to give HR teams hours and hours and days and days and months and months back and also just make the feedback so much better i am just like yeah i'm very passionate about this space <laughs> no and we can see it coming out of your just your facial expressions and everything there. It's fantastic stuff people folks do check it out i actually haven't seen a similar product um so it is it is one of those things that is kind of creating its own little unique space out there um, but particularly if you care about this transition of people in and out, the entire experience for every single stakeholder, I think it makes a ton of sense. Um, it really, really is uh, very, very interesting. I've just shared the link, by the way, in the chat stream there. So make sure you go check it out. For the folks on LinkedIn, um, it's uh, dadohr.com. So D-A-D-O-H-R.com. Um, okay, yeah. cool. Let's have a look at the newsletter from last week. Um, Ariel, did you read it? And if so, what was interesting about it? I always read your newsletter. It's my favorite. Um, I love the cheating about ChatGPT with ChatGPT. Like I have so many thoughts on ChatGPT and how AI um, is going to influence, we'll say, this domain. And I thought I, I thought this was just really great information. Small scale, right? So not statistically significant, but very interesting. Um, in many ways, in which it'll just kind of pop up. Uh, loved the the conversation about Google. You know, I um okay, go played at the Google offices while I was there. <laughs> I set this up, so I've been, so I I've seen it in its early days, and I have lots of friends who work there now. Um, and this is, this is um, they're really feeling it. It's a really 
great example of how the culture is so important to a company's success and how important the domain of the people team is in being able to, to actually help a company, um, we'll say, be who it is and be able to have that business impact. You know what, on, on this, I mean, Google's had a, obviously a really interesting moment um, because at the same time, they're rolling out all of these innovations. Um, uh, they're also cutting back. So they're kind of doing what a lot of those big tech companies are as well. It, it's it's kind of like we're just abandoning certain functions and, and certain sort of products. We're kind of making sure that that's not the focus. We're diving full forward into the AI side. And, and what's happened here is basically a lots of like long tenured um, uh, Google employees have come out and said, you know what, this is what I've learned from 18 years working at Google. Um, and these people are writing some really interesting anthropological kind of an, uh, mm-hmm. sort of essays to say, you know what, when Sergey and Larry were doing this and then it suddenly turned into that and it became very, very interesting. And by the way, you know, I, I think it's fair to say Google haven't really like iterated products um uh, up until this current moment um there was like you know nothing particularly new lots of new things started and then they were canned all the time it seemed google seemed to have this habit of just pushing something out experimenting you want to know why weeks and go on tell them i can tell you because if you know the engineers there their promotions are based on whether or not they launch something not whether or not it's successful so they launch things all the time yeah, so overlaunch maybe. It's just like throw, throw, mm-hmm. throw. Absolutely. And then it's like there's no need to push through and execute further forward. So, mm-hmm. yeah, the incentives drive behavior makes sense. And in fact, only this week, I think I'm going to put this article into the um, uh, tomorrow's newsletter or Sunday's newsletter, should I say. I think the, um, the, the, the Google for Jobs update, which, you know, had a few people look excited about recently, apparently that's been pulled as well. And that was like, well, that was meant to change how companies kind of uh, you know, architect the information on on jobs. Uh, quite a big deal, but no, pulled for reasons unknown. It's like you know, why why not just like push it further, further forward? Craziness. So we don't know what's going on. Um, and anyway, loads of people are coming out and, and basically throwing um, you know uh, the company under the bus. And don't for, don't um, uh, sort of uh, forget that Google was still like very highly rated as employer of choice. I mean, still came in as number one uh, employer of choice on Universum Survey 2023. So you still have a lot of people coming into the business, maybe not have the direct experience working in there and saying, you know, I want to work for Google. But then you have a lot of people coming out and saying, you know what, it ain't what you think it is. Yeah. So yeah, really, really interesting. Uh, give us a couple more. Um, um, uh, what else is interesting? Oh, I love this office mandates um, doesn't help companies make more money. I mean, I I so believe this to be true. <laughs> uh, do you think it is true or do you think it was just, do you think this article is just like a little bit of um, a kind of a counterplay against this wave of RTO callbacks that that's coming through here? You know, honestly, what I hear behind the scenes is most of these like back in the office are motivated by like two big things, right? The cost of the real estate commitment the companies have already made and they want to feel like they, like they're not ready to, you know, call that sunk cost. Um, and part of it is, I think a lot around the the nature of like the executive team wanting to have, wanting that to be the case. And I think there's nothing wrong with that to say like, this is the company we want, like this is the culture we want, but then don't pretend it's because of something else, right? So. Um, I don't think that there's actually, I think if you, I think we can, you, you know, you talk about automatic in this as well, automatic is fully distributed. Uh, so we can see from plenty of companies that if you invest in a remote culture or hybrid culture, that it will be successful. If you don't, then of course the people who are not participating, who are othered are not going to be successful. So I think what we are seeing is that the, the 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 companies that were remote by design, so in other words, the ones that basically committed to remote pre-COVID, they weren't forced to do it. They just you already were remote. They're like very happy to stay that way. They're not going back anywhere. 
but the companies that were forced to do so and then kind of, you know, uh, uh, got high on the idea in the first instance, they're now like saying, okay, you've got to be coming back. I think EY is starting to track sort of turnstile data. Um, uh, you've got, I think, IBM, didn't they come out? Was it IBM or JP Morgan? I think it was one of those two. I forget which one. Please don't sue me for libel. But one of those two big companies um, said something. It was a leaked memo to say, look, if you're a manager, you have to be back in the office three times a week. Otherwise, I'll have your resignation. So that's pretty much, you know, you got to do it. Um, and and yeah, it's just, it, it, it's over really uh, for, for a lot of those big players. But anyway, um, let me know what you think on the RTO and this particular story. Um, does it actually help the bottom line or is it really managers are getting lonely and they want to, you know, get that buzz back that, they feel is important for them mm. um let me know in the comments um okay cool um let's have a quick uh review of this um conversation um Eric. i don't want to kind of uh, uh spoil uh, your contribution going forward because you've got so much to offer into the chat modern you know you, you're not just like an a static co-host that adding uh, you know inane uh, uh, uh comments over the top um you're actually an expert in this i don't, I, I want to use you as an expert in, in this conversation um but what are you what's your initial thoughts as to some of this uh, you know rather dramatic um episodes that we see particularly the you know the recording of the uh the layoff call itself i mean you know the the, the employee recorded the damn thing um and anticipated it was going to be a layoff recorded it and published it on tiktok and it you know went to 300 million people or whatever um like how to deal with that i mean it's like hard right i, I, I thought mean, the company was trying to do the right thing i mean they're you know they're, they're trying to have the one-to-one -one. they're not just doing an email they're trying to do it but yeah they had strangers do it i have lots of thoughts on that um yeah that's true. so first off like if you're afraid to be recorded then then you should probably not have a company today because like, I, I don't know what else to say, like, or don't hire people under the age of 60, I guess. But even, you know, <laughs> like, I think it's more about how do you, like understanding the culture that we live in, um, that should be planned as part of it. Like it's, that was embarrassing, not because it was recorded, but because the way it was handled was embarrassing. <laughs> yeah. Um, and there are plenty of people I'm sure who have done layoff calls where the call was actually totally fine. Um, and it didn't get 300 million. Right. Um, I mean, that doesn't mean that people should like, you know, there are sensitive things and not everything should be reported, but you should go in with that assumption. Right. Like if people are yeah. publishing themselves, getting ready every day or like eating food, like this, they publish the whole life. Why would they not publish this incredibly stressful, dramatic moment for them? Yeah, I, I think that's basically the, having just a, a concept of, look, whatever you're going to have a, a Zoom call, it's going to be recorded. I think that mentality makes sense. Let's not forget, we're now using AI interview notes and AI meeting notes software anyway. So we're kind of getting used to the idea things do get recorded. Um, mm -hmm. So now I think it, it makes sense that if you're going to do um, any type of communication, um, then just default to the idea, look, are we okay with this going completely public? Um, because it yeah. might, it will, it will leak. Um, and nothing stays within the walls of the business, particularly when you've got high emotional uh, state and, and you've got, you know, inevitable acrimony. Um, and there's lots of reasons why, you know, the, the, the instance in, in this case uh, was Cloudflare, um, who let, you know, a lot of people go. Um, but there was a number of things that were a little bit weird on this, particularly given the fact, as you say, uh, the people who are making the call uh, first time uh, that they were speaking to the individual, they were just HR hatchet people, you know what I mean? And they, they, they couldn't do any more than just read a script as to why this lady was being uh, uh, laid off. Uh, and the, the, the individual, you know, challenged back to say, look, actually my performance is this, this, and they had nothing to say because they didn't have any more information. So in that situation, it seemed like HR had, had accepted an admin task when they should have pushed back and said, look, you know, where's the hiring, ma hiring manager should be delivering that because the hiring manager has the relationship and it makes a big difference. I think if the person that brought you difference. into the business, if they're there just to front it up, 
going to tell you. And again, I don't want to jump into in advance, but I want to I want to mention this real quick. Um, I forget the name of this gent who who, who I thought uh, he handled a similar situation. I think he worked for a big EV company, handled a very similar situation. He didn't blame anybody. And he actually accepted responsibility for him making the individual decision to fire specific people. That's what he said to the group. He, you know, he said, look, I have to let three people go. I'm going to make the decision specifically who these people are. I haven't made it yet, but I'm just going to go through what it is. And I'll just want to let you know it's on me. It's my decision. Uh, and then the, even the people that were let go ended up just like respecting the fact that he said that and said, you know what, I, I can deal with it. And uh, don't say it's about, you know, the numbers this. So don't say about, you know, um, it, make up reasons that aren't true. It's like, look, I've got to make the call somehow. It's a horrible decision. If I didn't want if if, if I didn't want it, kind of uh, uh, if I didn't have to make the decision, I wouldn't have done it. But I've got to make a tough call. And I'm, I'm going to it's on me. You yeah, know, I thought just I was own it. Good just own it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. All right. Let's bring on some of our guests and talk about it. We're going to do it in two ways, by the way. We've got like three people um, who have either been through uh, 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 reduction in force or have been managers that have kind of gone through this themselves. And then we've got, of course, our legendary friend from work work <laughs> workplace psychology, Jean Marie Caillot. Um, and he's going to come in and tell us about the psychology of this. Like, how do we actually? Uh, understand the psychology of this situation and, and make sure that all that improves. But anyway, let's bring on um, Leslie Kivett. Uh, oh, bring Sophie on first, as I see her right here. Um, main stage. Uh, we've got Leslie here as well. I hope Barat is here as well. Let me just see whether I can see Barat. Um, Jean Marie, I'll bring you on in a second, okay? Oh, we don't actually have Barat. Oh, there he is. Let's bring Barat on as well. Yeah. I mean, I'm ignorant of this because I've never actually been laid off, um, even though I have laid other people off. Um, but rarely. I'm not an expert at this. Um, so so I'm, I'm, I'm very happy to learn from people who basically had uh, some of this experience. Anyway, we have Sophie Powell with us. Sophie, wonderful to see you. Hey. Um, uh, why don't you quickly introduce yourself, Sophie? Who are you? What it is you do? Yeah, sure. So hello, everyone. My name is Sophie Power. I have been working in the talent acquisition space, specifically in startups, um, recruitment for about 11, 12 years, and then startups for about seven. Um, I am currently um, working on the community management side of things. So um, working with uh, the talent community, TTC, and also doing some work on uh, recruiter enablement with Adam, Adam Gordon and Holland McHugh. So, hello. Fantastic to see you, Sophie. Um, and we have Thank Leslie Kibbit back on the second consecutive week. I don't think that's ever happened before. <laughs> Breaking record. Um, great to see you, Leslie. Can you quickly introduce yourself? Likewise. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Leslie. I'm uh, the founder of the People Lab, where I help companies in emerging tech, such as AI, blockchain, and and other tech, um, you know, product with building out the people and culture teams. Uh, previously, I held HR leadership roles with uh, Xepo Bank, with Sender, and Meta, Booking.com, and Rocket Internet. So happy to be back. Um, great to Exciting. see you, Leslie. And we we have Barat as well. Barat, great to see you, man. Um, uh, why don't you quickly introduce yourself? Who are you? What it is you do? Hey, everyone. Uh, my name is Bharat, and uh, I'm a technical recruiter with currently with Meta, and I've been in this industry for more than 10 years, primarily hiring for product and tech, and uh, was in Dublin and then moved to Germany a, a year back. And then finally, Facebook GmbH uh, has its turn for uh, restructuring. And uh, here I am talking about offboarding now. Right. So very, very interesting because maybe you can see it from both sides. And I actually don't know what the experience is on the panel here, um, but I'm assuming uh, you've, you've, you've had to make redundancies before um, and, and had that conversation with others. And maybe you've had the experience of also being let go. Um, let's talk about sort of um, uh, how that was handled. Like what is consistently bad about this um, that you've either observed or experienced? Um, any particular thoughts, Sophie Go? Yeah, I think one of the things that I have noticed quite consistently is just 
a really poor management of actually explaining offboarding steps. So um, I have seen it happen and I've had it happen to me where it's, you know, certain things just haven't been explained, like uh, what's going to go, what's going to happen with final pay, um, when your last day is, what happens with IT handback, um, you know, sort of things like that, um, you know, and it creates a lot of uncertainty in what is quite an emotionally difficult, challenging time. So, you know, talked about in the, the chat comments and, and on here already. Um, so, yeah, that's kind of one of the things, you know, and if you compare it to the onboarding process, just to contrast it, where, you know, I've you know joined a company and seen my onboarding laid out step by step, day by day, uh, you know, got a really nice uh, sort of little Kanban board explaining exactly what I've got to do and when. And then, uh, you know, sort of at the exit point, it's just like, okay, off you go, bye. Um, it's it's not great. Like that communication piece really, you need a structured a communication with offboarding as you do onboarding. Um, well, I think, I think we can end, is, end, end, end yeah. the show right here. I mean, basically just mirror <laughs> a good onboarding with a good offboard. Like it should just be a mirror of it, right? So everything that is bad about onboarding, lack of information, ambiguity, that's exactly what happens in offboarding. Um, and by the way, I think when you uh, um, sort of have a moment of uh, anxiety, you don't know, that's when you spike the cortisol, cortisol levels. That's when basically, you, you know, you get really highly stressed. It, it, it doesn't matter yeah. how big or small uh, or how trivial or, or fundamental that thing is. If it's just a black hole, it's a missing component of information, it's, it's, it just draws on your energy. So you've got to make it very, yeah. very clear. Having a clear protocol on how to do it is obviously something that companies need to implement. Um, um, Leslie, your thoughts on common, I wouldn't say malpractice, that's too harsh. I don't think any company deliberately does this badly, but obviously it happens a lot. Um, so what are, the, what are the more common reasons how this goes wrong? Yeah, so I think also building on top of what Sophie said, <clears throat> I think it's overall also, um, you know, poor planning. I think planning is so, so important, specifically from, you know, from an HR and also from a people perspective that you plan basically up to the minute. Um, so, um, you know, we used an application in the past, which is called, you know, you basically create a TikTok and the TikTok is basically an explanation of what you're going to do at the literally hour, um, you know, of those days that you're moving towards, um, um, you know, sort of execution. So, you know, when I think about, um, layoffs or, you know, restructures, I often, you know, recognize a couple of different phases. There's like the pepper phase where we look at, you know, talent management and basically all that stuff. Um, there's another phase, which is basically called the training phase, where you go into all oh, training your managers, also training your CEO, right? On you know, so what is the message that we actually want to convey? Uh, because important is there will also be people left, there will be employees left, right? After you deliver the message, and these are often also forgotten. Uh, there's an execution phase, right? So basically the day of the happening, and then there is also post layoffs or like a morning phase almost. Um, and where I see the biggest problems usually is around, um, yeah, so basically about the planning and then also the day itself, right? So how is the news actually delivered? Um, you know, how are managers actually trained? Are there a management team also coming out as one team? Or are you a manager that's going to say, yeah, look, it wasn't my decision, but it was the decision of, you know, person I, right? And these are sort of elements, right, that will basically determine the, you know, the future of your company as well. And if you will be able, for example, to keep also the people that you want to keep, um, you know, after the whole, uh, um, you know, restructure is happening. Um, Leslie, just a quick one, mate. Um, there's something might be a little bit uh, weird with your mic. Um, so so um, oh. I don't know whether it, it's a movement thing or something like that, but I have a, have a fill with it. But very good point. Um, I think on the training side, I ran a LinkedIn poll on this and over 50% of people who were in managerial positions actually had never had any training whatsoever on how to offboard people. Um, yeah. So, so we're, we're, uh, this is why I've got some sympathy when you hear these negative stories and everyone throws the company under the bus. I think, you know what, the company probably didn't want to be an absolute brute on this, but the, the, you might just have a lot of already highly stressed managers that have not been trained on how to do it. Um, and then, you know, obviously they go and make mistakes. So, uh, I mean, so Han, are you is... trying to tell me that a company that doesn't train its managers also ends up laying people off? Well, yes. Um, I mean, there's all kinds of like arrows that point in certain directions, right? And you know, um, I, I also think it's one of those where 
you know, layoffs typically don't happen unless companies have already got to a very high stress point. Um, uh, you know, so they're hanging on, hanging on, hanging on, and then they make um, a, a decision um, um, when obviously things are already falling apart, let's say, um, and arguably they may want to make that decision earlier um, before things get too stressed so that they can handle that exit a little bit better. Um, but who knows? Um, Barrett, let's go to you. I mean, I don't want to sort of draw into your current situation or, you know, whether there's anything you can't say or don't want to say, but it, sort of things that you've seen or observed that you think, yeah, could have been better. Why does this seem to happen often when, you know, layoffs uh, occur? So I, I would pick both the points that Sophie and Leslie made. Uh, the first one is a, a very st- sort of a structured way of offboarding list. And we have had that, but the execution was poor. So it's not just sufficient to have a great onboarding list, but then if you don't know how to execute that, if you don't have the right people responding to the right set of things, or if you don't have a point of contact, um, be it your manager or your HRBP, whoever it is, and people just circling around themselves saying, okay, I'm not the right person. You should check with the manager. Manager comes back and says, you, you have to check with your HRBP. And the HRBP says, we have to check with legal. Because a lot of these documents are vetted by legal and uh, nothing can be said or done without legal being giving a go-ahead. So yeah. your offboarding okay. should also come with, a very clear picture on who is the point of contact and what is the level of authority they have to talk about. All right. Really, really good point. I think that's the bullet point kind of number three there, isn't it? So we've already talked about, look, um, ambiguity. You have to eliminate ambiguity from flow. It's got to be very clear as to what process is. Got to have more training to managers. They've got to have the, you know, support to deliver it. Um, And thirdly, avoid the situation where, the, the the individual, the employee who's been let go has to chase and be rebuffed in, in different places. You know, they've already been rejected um, because you've decided to let them go. And now the person is trying to find information. And you're saying, oh, not me, it's this person. And, it, you know, how is that making that person feel? Every, every time that happens, it's just the, it, in, another thing that causes rancor to occur. Um, yeah, it, it, I, I really agree with that. I think um, as well, like, it's already stressful enough losing your job. And then if you're, you know, sort of uh, still like a month after you've lost your job, you're trying to find another job, but you're still trying to tie up loose ends with your previous employer because they've not managed your offboarding properly and you're being sent on a wild goose chase. Like you're really compounding the stress for your former employee and your other employees will find out about it. So the ones you did retain, like they're seeing that happening as well and going, well, things are going great for me now. But what about when they're not? Is this what happens? Um, you know, I think, yeah, Bath, I, I really agree with, with what you said. Yeah, it's a really good point. Yeah, so on this issue, it's almost like, I don't want to kind of use a, a, the wrong analogy, but maybe it's like a little bit of a fire. Um, you've got to kind of um, sort of put it out immediately. Otherwise, it just spills over and gets worse. And the more stress you put into the rest of the business, then, you know, the more kind of, if you like, cultural overhead that builds up because suddenly you have to have more one to one. Suddenly you have to, you know, lots of people asking more questions and, you know, you, your capacity then goes down because you can't handle it. And your service delivery uh, to, to all of the people that need this information will also go down. Um, should companies appoint uh, someone specifically? to deal with the, the, the layoff coordination, like just second them into doing this function, do you think? Or is that is that not smart? Um, I mean, I think from a consistency perspective, there's, there's merit in it, um, definitely. I think having one person, if nothing else, just be the point of contact and own sort of communicating that. I think if, if you've got a large number of layoffs, I think it's a smart idea um you know um and then uh, you know sort of somebody to go actually has that been done has that been done um I think when I've seen it go awry is when you know sort of 
finance is doing payroll, but they're not talking to the people team who aren't talking to, you know, the product team who's who's laid off some people. Um, and then they've not coordinated with um, the sales team that have let some people go as well. And it's all just gone a bit. No one really knows who to talk to. Um, so I think, you know, if you are doing a large number of layoffs, I think, yeah, there's a lot of merit in having one person. What do other people think? I mean, yeah, so from project. my perspective, I need a project I, manager. Oh, please go ahead. No, I was just saying it's a project. You need a project manager. Yep. Yep. Sorry, go ahead, Lindsay. Yeah, so from my perspective, it should be the head of people. It should be the chief people officer or whoever has the has the leading, I think, HR role. Um, right. It's, it's like I said at the beginning, a lot, like a lot of it is about planning. And the whole process itself already starts with, um, you know, planning who, you know, who's staying and who isn't. And uh, you will need your entire, what is it, executive team or at least, you know, management team and T to sort of have a look at that. And I think it's a role of, uh, you know, of a people team also to guide that process and to make sure that everybody sort of adheres also to the process. Um, and your CEO is the, like, is the hammer, right? And needs to make sure that if there are still loose ends that this person basically makes sure that, uh, you know, you deliver that information on time. Um, yeah, I I have a really interesting thought then um, off the back of what you said, Leslie. Uh, I do agree. It's yep. owning it and, and overseeing it is is a people team um, responsibility and making sure that all the do all the dots join up. Um, you know, yep. um, although I do think there's a lot of merit in the manager who made the decision having the conversation with the person they've got the relationship with, but last year and the year before like famously a lot of the people being laid off were people people yep. um so who controls it when the person being let go is the person that is responsible for managing it like what what happens then do we think yeah um i mean i can't judge the companies right that doesn't you know they don't have any people you know person anymore right yeah um so yeah uh, you know i've <laughs> luckily been in situations where you know we still had folks that were working in either in like a what is like the people team or working more like in a recruiting function yeah. um and in most situations at least where i've been there was nobody there that has experienced a layoff or like a restructure before so for you know many folks within that you know team it's also a first experience um mm -hmm. but you know before you get into the actual you know execution stage there is so much planning again and information together right you need to speak with investors have investors already you know have, have they already been also through such a um, um you know period uh, you know do you have peers um so i think there are a lot of conversations to be had um and i would also like to double down on what you said like look when we move to the execution phase there should always be a manager present it should ideally always be the manager that has been a manager of this person you know for such a long time but i also think right to be the um, um you know, to help, right, also with the process, there should be that HR person. And I think that, you know, that famous videos um, also that we're all, you know, referring to, um, I think there were two people from HR, if I actually remember it correctly, and they both had no relationship, right, I think with the person in question, and that's always the crucial mistake. There is no emotional relationship with that person. And I guess, like, there are always um, reasons, perhaps, why that manager wouldn't be able to attend, because maybe that manager wasn't there anymore. But I'm I'm even I'm even pretty sure that even in that situation you will be able to find someone within a dotted line that has worked you know with this you know with this person in any capacity, and I think what that made the situation even worse is that you had a CEO I think the next day after the recording actually came on Twitter and said like look this is another restructure, this is just how you do performance management uh, uh, you know basically at the company, uh, basically shooting himself in the foot. <laughs> uh so and, you know so it's it's uh it's it's you know this dynamic i guess also between hr and ceos will always be interesting among many different topics outside of you know reorganizations obviously also uh right but this was a clear uh, you know misfire sorry it's a very long answer <laughs> <laughs> no it's it's an interesting topic and there's there's loads of uh sort of interesting things in the, the comments as well about it i think people feel really mm -hmm. strongly about this especially after last year um so yeah no it's, yeah yeah. Do you know, what, one thing that's also worth bearing in mind is also what the, the core company culture is, particularly where the, 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 the genesis of the company is, I think, really determines the, the manner in which they approach things. 
So we know in the US that it's pretty standard to have like at will type contracts, right? Um, so I do believe if that's the default, then uh, of course that would mean that people are going to be a lot more brusque with the, the entire uh, episode um, because there, there, there isn't um, kind of a, any, any huge compliance risk. There isn't a huge kind of uh, period of time that you have to go through. In Europe, of course, the, the work protections, I think, are significantly higher um, and there's, a, there's, there's lots of procedures that you need to go through uh, before you can, 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 can make that decision. Um, so hence, maybe, is, is, it, is it better in Europe? I mean, I, I don't know. Well, does anyone feel that maybe we can make a broad generalization of boarding is better yes. in Europe simply because of the rest? Am I the only American on the call? I don't know. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> what do you think, Ariel? Is, is, do you think? Yeah, I mean, so so... In the U.S., you can let someone go for basically whatever reason. There are asterisks to that depending on where you are. Um, and the unemployment benefits are significantly different. You like you can you can't even pay your rent on unemployment, and you lose your health care. And like, it's not the same as laying somebody off in Europe, where like the government steps in and it, like there's like transition periods and all of this stuff. Like you can you can make someone homeless by like. By laying them off, and um, it's important to remember that <laughs> it's really important to remember that that you can completely upend an entire someone's entire life. Well, you but, know what? Like, it, it, now yeah. that you mention it, I mean, most of these uh, stories where uh, sort of there has been PR disasters, um, and and the, the 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 laid off candidate, the employees have gone to social media. There have been U.S. examples, so I wonder whether yep. it's almost like a um, a, a kind of a, a very natural reaction to the significance of the not only for the manner of the decision, but the significant consequences are so immediate um, that you know you have to do something. I mean, there's people on visas, for instance. If they get laid off, they may may have like 30 days or whatever, how long it is um, before mm -hmm. uh, they have to go go back home. I remember there was one community member you know had to raise a GoFundMe to re relocate his family back to australia because he because he lost his he lost his job no and he couldn't yeah. find another oh. so that the ha it's very very difficult um so yeah maybe there's a there's a there's a a lot of the i wouldn't say fault but a lot of the uh, the anxiety actually can be solved at a, at, a, at the government or state level um, that, uh, you know, unfortunately our U.S. friends just have to wrestle with it, it to a large degree. Yeah, um, I mean, in the U.S. you can report, oh. like, report, in the U.S. you can report the biggest profits you've ever had and then they're like, we're just going to fire everyone. And you're like, what? Yeah. <laughs> in well, we, Europe, we, you really struggle to do that. Wasn't there something the now with Spotify, actually? Right, that Spotify actually tried to let go people. I think in Holland it was, and then they were yeah. actually blocked by the government because they didn't adhere to the right, um, you know, sort of process. Yeah. So, yeah, I think in Europe, you're, you're, yeah, you're absolutely better protected. Yeah, I think, I mean, uh, working in an international business, um, a huge, obviously, international organization, Barat, um, how do you, how do you kind of layoffs operate there? Do you think there's like a universalized culture of how it operates, or is there, is it, uh, uh, like com country specific like is it, is it does it does it has it evolved to a country specific way of dealing with things um Bara? so it, it is i think when the the first uh layoff happened uh they didn't realize how complicated european laws would be and uh, they did some uh, uh seemingly simpler or easier mistakes that could have been avoided but then like for example once the layoff was announced over emails, uh, they just uh, removed access to everyone, including Europe, which is not the case because you have consultation period, you have work, uh, work council, all of those. That means you're still employed until all of these agreements have come into play and they've agreed by all parties involved. So they kind of uh, said that uh, this was a... Uh, Stab in the system and hence they reinstated the, the access to uh, a lot of people who lost access by end of the uh, of the announcement. But then the process is completely different for each country. Uh, UK, for example, has a 45 day consultation. From where I am, Germany, uh, we were uh, announced that Germany will go through the restructuring plans sometime in like starting in June. 
up until then uh, meta voluntarily said go ahead and form all your all your work council and uh, once the the talk started in june it finally reached an ending in first week of october and then the uh, the entire communication was uh, informed to us and this was a process that started way back in november 2022 uh, like we were constantly under the mindset that okay my job might not be safe and that's a mental stress that you do not want to go yeah. through and nobody prepares you for this uh, so and nobody cares about this so a lot of the uh, people that we were talking about who is responsible who should be there in uh, talking about layoff information all of those I would also add one more person, somebody from the general counsel of the company, because a lot of this is legal language. Yes, you will you will have your own personal lawyer, but then immediately the questions that start coming in, the HRBPs, the, the managers, or whoever the person, they are not equipped to answer these questions unless there is a lawyer present. So and and this is the team that is always not existent whenever you are reaching out to someone and everybody hides behind the fact that okay i need to check with legal i need to check with legal so have someone from legal and then get answers as quickly as you can because do not delay this process you're already in a mindset where you've let go of the person but then they have questions you still have a an obligation to them to answer those questions and make this process as smooth as possible. Well, why yeah. hasn't anybody implemented a, a, a chat GPT for this? Um, because it, it seems to me that some of these questions will be a fixed response. It's, it's like like the, the HR people don't want to say anything because they don't understand the law. A hiring manager doesn't get it either. Doesn't want to out, outstep his, his field. You know what? Why don't you just train um, sort of uh, an AI to be able to respond or even you know, preempt the situation by publishing some of the frequently asked questions so that, you know what, here's what the, a few few things you might be curious about at this point. Here are some answers already pre-prepared so you know exactly where to go rather than, you know, be in that situation where you're dodging the questions or batting them to someone else. Um, so, so yeah, I, I think and the company did. Sorry, sorry, Hans, I, I sorry to cut you in between. And the company did. They learned from their mistakes. So they started publishing the, the frequently asked questions. And this was a continuously updated one. So if a lot of people are asking the same questions, that goes in a frequently asked question, the document gets updated and resent to everyone who has affected. Such that uh, the next time somebody asks the same questions to HRBP or the manager, usually it gets pointed towards the FAQ and say, this is the question number that you're asking. Go through that and come back to me if you need more information. And that document, the FAQ is a legally vetted document. So they, they, they are confident in saying that you can refer to that document and then come back if you need more information. Yeah, very yeah. good. So I think people need so to get busy. Let's go ahead. Let's I think with this is, yeah, so my experience is, I think specifically for companies of this size, it's like they, they also isolate these issues, right? Because they, they are still, you know, they're still a working product, right? So obviously basically when this happens then this 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 situation removes to employee relations which is a completely different uh you know sort of hr you know facet within the whole realm of hr basically right so it's just i feel it's um you know probably due to departorization legal obviously and sort of try to minimize this because i also saw this in the chat most employees will not sue right or will um you know consider you know making legal steps and there's probably, I don't know the percentage, but I, yeah, right, but I can imagine that it's, uh, it's, it's probably a small percentage. And it's, it's sad that these larger, you know, companies can probably also afford it because, you know, supply and demand is probably still, you know, like a ton of people that still wants to work for Meta, um, you know, even if they're, you know, treating their employees actually poorly. Um, I mean, that's different, you know, probably if you're a smaller company, but for a company of the size of Meta, it's probably something that you can afford. Yeah, very interesting. Okay, folks, listen, um, really great having your, your inputs on this, but we've got to move on. I want to bring Jean-Marie on and look at the psychology aspect of it, because I think this is going to be super important. Um, so thank you, Barad, for joining us. Thank you, Leslie, and thank you, Sophie. 
Um, great to see you guys. By the way, if anybody is looking or hiring for TA, talent, et cetera, obviously Barat might be looking at some point in the near future. I don't know what your situation is, either Sophie or even you, Leslie. I have no clue. Um, but get in touch with all of these folks. Get talking to them. Um, there may well be opportunities um, for and reasons for you to connect, uh, which actually leads us on to this critical part of the show because uh, we always do this, folks, at every single sort of uh, midway point or at least, you know, three quarters point of the show. Um, uh, we want to make sure that people are connected with each other in these types of trying times. Uh, the way in which we do this is simply grab your LinkedIn URL, share it into the chat stream if you're watching this on Crowdcast, and then connect with everyone everyone else who you've seen do the same. Um, if you're watching this on any of the LinkedIn's, um, grab your LinkedIn URL, just copy it from the URL bar and paste it into a comment and then connect with everyone you see doing that. Um, worst case scenario, you'll walk away from this conversation with 20, 30, 40, maybe even 50 new connections that will boost your network in 2024. Um, okay, cool. Let's bring on Jean-Marie Caillot. Um, very interested to see um, or to hear, you know, the psychology angle on this. Um, interesting chat with those uh, three, wasn't it? Um, very quickly identified certain best practices, I guess. Um, and we'll, we'll come back to maybe what tooling is available. Maybe there is something that kind of um, makes sense uh, for folks as well, uh, Ariel. So I'll make sure we'll, we'll, we'll touch on that. But let's bring on uh, Jean-Marie. Um, and see where we go. That's uh, sorry for the sniffles, by the way, folks. I still haven't shook this this uh, um, this illness. Um, yeah. By the way, Barrett's blog's really interesting. Quite a technical one, um, but I think it's a really good way to you know for recruiters to break down. Uh, what it is. Wow, that's a huge head, Jean-Marie. Um, you know, I'll, but hey, I'm the same way. Let's go big. Um, uh, <laughs> <laughs> oh, excuse me. Get that back if you prefer. <laughs> no, no, no. Let's get right in there, man. Um, hey, Jean-Marie, can you quickly introduce yourself for you? What it is you do? Yes, very quickly. Four days a week, I help companies uh, get better at hiring in uh, talent acquisition and employer brand. And one day a week, I deal with the candidates and the employees who didn't make the cut uh, as a work psychologist. So I have kind of a, both views from the HR point of view and the, um, the, employ the disappointed employees uh, on the other side, I may say so. <laughs> let's, let's deal with the, um, the HR's point of view first, because let's not forget their psychology. Um, you are letting people go or you're involved in this process. You're probably not liking this. I'm assuming this is one of the, 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 the parts of the job you don't embrace. Um, so what should we understand about the psychology of these people and how can employers or, you know, colleagues support HR at this point? Well, uh, to be honest, uh, I don't know if that's because uh, 2023 has been a big year with layoffs. There has been a tremendous amount of research on layoff on the last couple of years. So we have, uh, we have learned very interesting things. Um, first, but I'm not, it won't come as a surprise that nobody goes to HR or management to say no to people. I mean, it's not something uh, that we like to do. We prefer to say yes, uh, especially when it comes to, to recruitment. But um, managers, uh, are most of them are not okay with dealing with layoffs. So uh, what we know is how it works. It, uh, it's a very indiv individual thing. I mean, uh, some people will be okay more easily than others, and, but for most of them, it will always have a moral cost. So it will cost them something. Uh, it's not like it's something that's easy to do. It creates kind of a cognitive dissonance. Uh, so like you're supposed to do something, but you're not okay with what you have to do. And so what we observe is that most of the time, uh, if you want to be able to live with it, uh, managers and HR just try to, um, they kind of shift their perception of the layoff. And even if they're personally, morally don't accept it uh, in order to make room for it in their own practice, because they have to, because they are, they are asked to, they uh, kind of shift their perception and try to uh, uh, focus on what's good about the layoff. 
because if they don't, you know, they, they just can't go home and look themselves in the mirror. So, uh, so this is how it works, which I don't know if that's a good or bad news, but the take from it, uh, I would say is uh, as a company, whether you're a, a CEO, a finance director or an HR director, if you, are, if you require your people to deliver the bad news, you need to make a lot of sense about it because the, all the energy that managers and HR people won't spend on trying to make sense of the layoff for themselves, they will be able to freeze that energy and use it uh, to uh, help the people who are being laid off to, uh, to make sense of it. Uh, so I don't know if that's clear, and if I explain it correctly, but this is what we know about the psychology of it. I mean, individually, there's no, uh, there's no real uh, difference between being a manager and being an HR person here. You're just the person delivering the bad news. And uh, of course, if you are the direct managers, it can be more impactful because you've spent more time with the person that you are uh, letting go. But I think that's interesting to focus not only on the psychology of the people who are being laid off because, you know, it won't come as a surprise. It's bad. It's pretty bad. The impact of a layoff uh, can be really important. And it's been discussed today, um, a great chat, by the way, already. Uh, I'd like to focus on the psychology of the people who are not being let go, the people who stay, because we don't talk enough about themselves. Mm. And the impact is very important. And, you know, uh, we're talking about uh, image and uh, employer brand as well. And employer brand comes from within. So uh, in my opinion, it's important to focus on what happens here. And what research has shown uh, lately, and I have like some papers from late 2023. So that's very, uh, that's fairly new. Uh, what we know about it is that uh, anxiety and, um, and doubts are not a good situation. What I mean by that is that uh, the more, if you are not let go, the more you are left in doubt, the more you tend to surrender to it, and then you, you know, you, you you stop hoping for it, and so it has a very very deep and bad impact on your mental health. Uh, so what I would recommend is not only communicate about the decision to let people go, but also communicate uh, about the decision to keep people. And it's very important to not be in, to not be left in doubt. You know, doubt again is never a good situation. Anxiety uh, leads to really bad stuff. So, and, and, and you know, if you made the decision to fire people, you also made the decision to keep the others. So there's no point in left, leaving them in doubt. Uh, of course, you can't always guarantee their future, but at least in them, this is why you're staying. And so, in order to reassure them. Yeah, well, a very I important point. Uh, no, no, no. I, I, I don't want to interrupt you, actually, Jean-Marie, um, but I want to just underline the point you're making, uh, which is actually when you're making the layoff announcement, you, you need to make a parallel announcement to the to the, reten the people you've retained. Um, uh, don't just ignore them and say, you know, and, and have them just, you know, wipe their brow and, wow, the relief of not being uh, being let go. Message them to say, look, um, Ariel, this is the reason why you know you're not on 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 this riff um, because you've done this, this, and this. You want to make sure um, that they're still productive. Uh, I think someone in the in the in the comments said, "Look, if productivity crashes um, amongst the staff that aren't let go because they can see everyone, you know, the friends leaving and so on." So you've got to get them boosted. And you've got to get them kind of thinking moving forward in a positive way as soon as possible because no one is helped when everyone's in a negative spin. Um, you know, that's, it's almost like if you're all drowning together, nothing's going to help. You need a few people that are still mm -hmm. swimming strongly um, and, and that's going to move things forward. So, uh, so yeah, you've got to address um, the people that, um, that, that are staying. Um, I'm a manager, Jean-Marie. Uh, let's say, what advice would you give from us? I'm not, you know, I, basically, I'm not good at this. You know, I self-identify as someone who is not good at making these tough decisions. <clears throat> How would you help me through this? Like, what is this? What kind of coaching or self kind of conversations do I need to have in order to be able to do this uh, better? You know, there's, a, there's one very good starting point and curiously uh, and ironically, it's exactly the same as before you start a new hiring, a new hiring mission. Uh, it's like you don't start something that you don't understand. So 
uh, as much as when uh, I advise HR people to not start to, uh, in a hiring assignment if they don't fully understand why they are hiring and what kind of pro profile, when you're letting someone go, if you don't fully understand why you are letting this specific per person go and the impact it's going to have uh, on this employee, just wait to do it. Even if your management is asking you, your upper management is asking you to do it as fast as possible, you have the right to ask more questions and require more information. Uh, because if you don't have the information to provide to the person who is being let go, I mean, this is the, not a big thing to ask, you know, uh, when you are being let go, to, to be able to ask for more information. Uh, so this is not, a, this doesn't need to be a, to be a, a dark box or, or even a gray box, it needs to be as clear as possible, as much, gather as much information as you can. And when you feel, you will never feel perfectly comfortable with it, but when you feel that makes sense, a bit of sense for you, then you might be able to, to make it, a, I'm not gonna say better moment, it's would not a great, but a, a less violent moment uh, for the person who is being let go. Yeah, and, and actually by being um, very clear in your own mind as to why this particular individual is being let go, you can communicate that to that person so that there isn't that sense of, look, have you got it wrong? Uh, you know, did you not know about this part of my performance and all this type of thing, which can get really bad when the, the you know, the, 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 the individual starts arguing for the for, for their job you know you don't want this experience because by that time no one's going to argue themselves back in you know the decisions be made um but you've got to be clear uh, you can't just say one thing and then you know volunteer another bit of information or you know come up with another i think this is what happened in the cloud flare situation where there was one reason given candidate said actually no that wasn't true then another one was fished out and then you know clearly the, the the people didn't actually know why this person was let go and the ceo had to come in and say look this is the reason so it should have been very clear right from the very beginning um okay uh, let's switch quickly jean-marie to the psychology of the people uh, who have uh, receiving the bad news we understand can you give us just a, a very quick overview as to what the psychological state typically is um, and then let's talk about what steps, you know, we can, uh, what is the coaching steps to get them moving further forward optimistically? Yes. Well, uh, thank you for asking. Well, it, it, it's going to be quick because it's pretty transparent. No need to be a psychological uh, expert uh, on this. A layoff is mostly perceived as a treason first uh, by the people who've been let go. It's always about breaking trust, breaking trust. And, you know, it's not time sensitive. I mean, even if you surprise people, if they're surprised, they're not expecting to, to be laid off, you break their trust. But even if you give them enough time to prepare, they anticipate the moment, uh, am I gonna be let go, am I not? And this leads to anxiety, this is the same thing that we've said before, and so trust will be broken as well. So there, uh, you will break it, there's no other way around it, except for a very specific individual case when people are expecting to be let go because they expect a package or something kind of situation happens. But most of the time, um, it's a broken trust issue. So uh, th th there's no real like magic trick around it. Uh, in order to recover, you need yourself to be able to, as we said, get as much information as you can. But if you're not being fed the information um, chances are that it's going to be difficult for you to dig in and get more info about the, about the reasons. Uh, so what you can do is get, find support in, um, in the group. I mean, we're talking about massive, massive layoffs. We're not talking about uh, one individual firing. So uh, like, it, it's good to be among people and to share and to talk about it. If you don't know the, the, all the information, all the reasons, there's no point in speculating, but at least Talk about how you feel. Uh, of course, if you feel that you, before looking for a new job, before thinking a new role, you you feel like you you need some help. There is no shame in seeking professional help and go see uh, someone who can help you rebound at least like two or three times to uh, just talk about it. Uh, try to turn the page as quickly as possible. Uh, and then maybe get help about the next steps. And, you know, this is very simple. This is fair and square. Uh, there is no magic trick again. Uh, just 
talk to people, gather information and seek help if needed. Yeah, it's a breakup, folks. I mean, that's what it is. It's a breakup of a relationship, but that's going to be painful, of course. It's always more painful when you're not in control of that breakup, by the way. Anybody who's ever broken up I would understand that. Um, so typically when you're being let go, you're not in control of that. You haven't resigned. Someone's actually said, look, we're going to let you go. So you're going to have the pain. So you've got to understand that that's, you're going to have that um, sense of rejection. Very, very tough. Um, presumably the longer you've been or the more emotional effort you've given to the company, the more painful it will be as a result of, of because of the, of the social capital you've invested. So just understand it's going to be painful and, you know, allow yourself maybe some time to mourn for that. You know, you can't, you can't just rush straight into applying for jobs, even though the emergency is there understand the psychological need uh, to process and go through. Um, but then also understand that, you know, these things happen and actually they historicize much more quickly than we currently think is the case. Um, you know, it, it just feels massive right there and then, but it, you know, it's one of those, you look back year down the line, it's a lot smaller, three years down the line, it's actually a tiny thing. Five years, you might've even forgotten how you left that company. So it's one of those things that basically can be historicized and something uh, that you can uh, sort out. Uh, okay, guys, we've got to kind of end it there. Basically, well over time somehow. Uh, Jean-Marie, wonderful to see you. Sorry we didn't get you on earlier, man. Um, but we'll try and get you back for some more of your quality chat um, because you always find the time to drop some bombs, uh, even in the short time you're on the screen. Um, so Jean-Marie, wonderful to see you, sir. We'll see you soon. Uh, thank you for the invitation and great chat. Uh, I enjoyed the, the discussion before as well. So uh, very happy and uh, wish you a great weekend to everybody. Take it easy, Jean-Marie. Um, okay, Ariel, I kept you on for a long time, so sorry about this. Um, but I also wanted to bring you back in because I, I don't know whether Dado has tooling to help. I mean, I, I, I get the feeling yeah. most companies want to do better, but you know, has, has tech actually come in and you know, done anything to help? Yeah, we do have some, um, especially some consultancies who do, who are brought in for a riff and then like manage that, um, the employee facing parts of that using our tool. It's true. Um, I think it comes down to the same advice that we give on onboarding is that having a cleared, structured approach where people know how to engage and are, you know, supported through that process. Um, at any moment of stress in their employee life cycle, starting, ending, um, promotions, transitions, whatever, is really important to do. And taking the time to, like a lot of companies underestimate how much work goes into making that smooth. And if you're not gonna be, if you don't have the staff power to do that, then invest in a tool that will, because tools are cheaper than people, invest in a tool that will help ensure that that happens. Yeah, absolutely. There's there's ways in which we could do it better. And probably this comes down ultimately to CEOs as well. I, I do think uh, one yeah. of the things maybe that C-level probably do, um, and, and I, it's understandable, but I, I do think that if you hang on too long in the hope that things will improve, you, you'll end up just having less and less runway or capacity uh, to, to, to do the exit properly. So it's almost like being in that relationship too long. Um, you know, if you know you've got to make the decision, just make it earlier and then you've given yourself yeah. a little bit more runway to do it better, uh, which will leave everyone feeling better. It will give everyone better opportunity. Your existing retained staff will bounce back quicker. The people let go will find yeah. jobs more quickly. And the overall, yeah. you might even find that the company will bond together again uh, more quickly and be more effective after this difficult moment. Um Okay, listen, we've got to let it go. Uh, thanks for watching, everybody. I um, hope you've enjoyed the show. We'll be back next week. We're going to do it in the same time. It's going to be LinkedIn. Is it dead, dying, or what? It's going to be one of the most important shows I think we're going to do this year. Um, and the reason why we've seen a lot of big changes happening to LinkedIn, um, which I think is going to fundamentally change how sourcing works. Um, you might have noticed it already. Our ability to essentially use um, uh, X-Ray uh, to try and find candidates outside of LinkedIn from Google seems to be significantly compromised because um, LinkedIn is uh, is not no longer showing um, significant parts of uh, the, the the user profiles. 
Um, now, is this a bug? Is this a problem? Is there a workaround? Um, we're going to get together basically all the heroes I can, I can muster. Um, we've got amazing sources. Mike Santoro is going to join us. And then hopefully Jan Tegzi is going to join us. Um, Balash is going to join us. Irina is going to be there. Everyone is going to be there basically as a, as a massive town hall where we're going to say, look, what is the state of play with LinkedIn X-Ray? You have to watch it if you're a candidate finder and you rely either on LinkedIn or outside of LinkedIn to find candidates. Follow the channel if you want to watch. I'll be notified on that and register on the show because it's already up uh, for next week. Okay, we'll see you next week, folks. Thanks for watching. Bye. Cool. That was all right, wasn't it, Ariel? Great. Yeah. Okay, cool. What are you doing later? Mm -hmm going to sleep. I was up at 4.30 in the morning for this flight. <laughs> do you know what? I'm going to do the same. You know what? I went, I went, because I had a super early flight. I, I don't know if you got up early to go to your flight, but I, I didn't back myself to wake up in time. So I didn't all night at the airport. And uh, yeah, there wasn't any, any flat places to sleep. And yeah, just hadn't had any sleep. So I'm destroyed. Um, yeah, yeah, sleep immediately. All right. I'll let you go, Ariel. Have a nice snooze. It's always the same to you. Always a pleasure, hon. Um, I'll see you soon, okay? Next in town. Yeah, we'll do.